It's really nice to hear sort of what I've been doing uh, with myself for the last 40 years. <laughs> uh, but this really isn't about me. This is uh, about uh, an issue that I take very seriously. Uh, there are very few of us who don't know someone or have personally uh, systemic high blood pressure, particularly our African-American community, uh, where it really is a, a major challenge and uh, it affects our families, our communities, and our health, entire healthcare system. So uh, hopefully you'll bear with me uh, as I go through some details and, and talk a lot about the background uh, of this particular disease and how we can do something about it. Um, no financial disclosures uh, for me. Um, and uh, those of you who have heard me lecture, if, uh, if there was time, I always talk about a little bit of history. Uh, and this piece, piece of history is actually uh, a, a very interesting one because it was an opportunity that I feel was lost uh, in the history of the United States. Uh, talking about uh, President Roosevelt, FDR, and this was sort of towards the end of World War, War II. A lot of decisions were being made, as uh, those of, um, of many of us actually uh, remember what was going on back then. And, the development of the Manhattan Project, which was at University of Chicago, actually, uh, under the old football field, um, where they had the first sustained nuclear reaction and came up with the atomic bomb. And they were going to figure out how to end the war. And so uh, FDR was in the middle of all that. It was probably a little stressful, maybe a little bit. Um, and the, he had systemic hypertension. And if you, you could sort of read through what they were doing, uh, which was really not much. There were agents that they were trying to use, phenobarbital, which is really great for seizures, and it's a calm, it's a sedative, but uh, using that for blood pressure was probably not the best idea. Um, and what happens when you don't treat severe hypertension? You get heart failure, you get strokes, um, you get um, uh, kidney failure. Uh, you, you swell up, and you can actually end up uh, dying, um, which is what happened to him. Now, the, the strange part about this is that it didn't have to happen. This was 1945, okay? And it turns out that in the 1930s, there actually was a solution for, for severe hypertension in what I like to call it the original dietary approach to stop hypertension, um, yeah, the, the last part the little bit that you can see in blue colors, DASH, the DASH diet, they've done some wonderful studies that I'll uh, go through with you. Um, but they didn't uh, really start it back in the uh, 1980s. This was actually came from uh, Dr. Kempner, uh, and he started with the Kempner rice diet. And many of you have heard of this. Uh, it really was in the 1930s. And, and he was treating people with rice and fruit, tomatoes, and he had dramatic results. If you look at what happened to the blood pressure to a patient who came in and was given this food, given away from their American food, um, the result of the blood pressure improvement was absolutely dramatic and very sustained, very consistent. And so we really have had uh, a nutritional approaches to improving blood pressure for decades. And so how long did it take to get really mainstream? Really almost 50 years before it was recognized by the establishment. And still, it's not the first thing that physicians think of. Uh, what are you eating? Uh, what's, what's the dietary content? Um, but I can tell you that we have focused on it in our last set of um, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology guidelines. If, if it's missed by physicians there, it's because they're not looking at the document because it's absolutely everywhere. Okay. The scope of the problem, I'm going to do that over the next few slides. Um, if you look at it, you would think that, oh, you know, Kempner Rice diet, people will adopt it, uh, everyone will fix their food, and the incidence of high blood pressure will go down. But as you can see on these curves, it's not going down. It's actually going up, okay, uh, over time. Uh, it's pretty much everywhere. Um, and the, it's not just in the United States, it's a global burden of, uh, of uh, severe hypertension. And it's something that we deal with every day as physicians. And so your typical patient coming in, uh, in this case, uh, doing a little bit of a case presentation, you, you can see our really is sort of like the, the amalgamation of what I do in my uh, clinic. A patient coming in, 
uh, referred usually by primary care because the blood pressure was high and they weren't exactly sure what they ought to be doing because the patient has multiple risk factors, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, as well as high cholesterol, and they're a smoker. Um, blood pressure is in the 150s. Uh, the cholesterol is not good. Fortunately, the kidneys are good in this case, but uh, there's markers of diabetes. And so the real question that uh, I'd like to focus on for those of you who are listening, those of you who are patients, um, <clears throat> uh, people who are in this situation, the practitioners, is what do the guidelines say should be the next step? Um, do we start medication? Do we monitor blood pressure in the office? Do we do it at home? How long do we do it? And so hopefully um, that we'll keep that question uh, in the back of our minds as we go forward. Okay, well, how big a problem is it? About 78 million adults in the United States at least, and uh, the number goes up depending on how you define it and who's, who's doing the measurement and where you do the measurement. Uh, it obviously is the biggest risk factor, um, uh, and it is a completely modifiable risk factor for the cardiovascular disease burden that has uh, plagued us in the United States for over 100 years. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, how well do we do? Uh, going around the world, this is a, a global problem, and you see countries that are 50-50-50, where 50% 50 of the people who have high blood pressure know about it, 50% of the people who know about it are being treated, and 50% of people who are treated actually have control. Uh, we do a little bit better than that uh, in the United States, but not much. Uh, we have a long way to go. What happens to people whose blood pressure is out of control? Well, they can uh, lose the heart function. The function of the heart, the heart will start to fail. First, it starts failing in terms of relaxation. Uh, if it goes on untreated, you end up with heart failure uh, after the walls of the heart thicken, so-called left ventricular hypertrophy, or LVH. Uh, it actually produces coronary heart disease as well, and so one of the major um, causes of heart attack. It causes kidney failure. <clears throat> and if you ever look in a dialysis unit and you go through and you ask, you'll find some diabetics, you'll find some people with lupus, but the majority of people either have or have had high blood pressure contributing to their kidney failure and putting them on dialysis. It contributes to peripheral artery disease, and that is a major issue uh, that stops people from exercising, which uh, then, of course, complicates the blood pressure because exercise is one of the most important things that we can do to uh, avoid uh, worsening of the blood pressure. Retinopathy, take that one personally because it happened to my dad with a hypertensive crisis, blind for the rest of his life. Uh, this is something that people don't recognize, that um, the eyes are very sensitive to real high blood pressures. And uh, everyone who has high blood pressure really should have an ophthalmologic examination because the eyes really do need to be protected. Uh, last but not least, it's strokes and transient ischemic attacks. And the brain is so precious, and I have many patients who will tell me point blank, I'd rather die than have a stroke because it changes, that burden of a stroke changes their life, the family's life, everyone's life around them. Uh, so these are the interesting part of, of all of these organ uh, issues is that they're preventable if we can just get the blood pressure to be normal. We're not alone in this. It really is a global hypertension burden. It seems to be getting worse uh, over time. And we really need to try to figure out how to, to do all of our modifiable risk factors. No one should be smoking. Everyone should know what their cholesterol is. Um, there are a variety of things that we can do to protect our health, but the number one numerically actually is hypertension. So I'm glad Stephen let me talk about it. Because, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Let's talk about coronary heart disease, which really still is the number one uh, cause of death in the United States. And I will talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, and there's an intense relationship between the blood pressure and the incidence of IHD, ischemic heart disease. So those are fancy words for blockage of your coronary arteries resulting in um, the lack of blood flow to the heart. Uh, and that happens uh, progressively as the blood pressure rises. Most people are not familiar with this. Most physicians are not familiar with this slide. If I could just get this on a billboard somewhere, it would be great. The fact that cardiovascular death 
actually doubles with every 20 millimeter increase in the top um, or systolic blood pressure from 115. So everyone thinks at 135, oh, that's not so bad. Well, it kind of is. That is, that if you look at the death rate from cardiovascular disease, it actually doubles between 115 and 135. 155 doubles again. 175 doubles again. Okay? And so everyone should know what their blood pressure is. They should know everyone's blood pressure in their family uh, and be trying to get uh, far below the 130. Okay, let me just delve into one of my favorite topics. Um, uh, the one thing I, as I was listening to all of the things that, you know, that, uh, that someone wrote into my little bio, um, it actually didn't include the part where I worked for Medicare for four years uh, as one of the uh, HOSP, HOPS, that's Hospital Outpatient Prospective Payment System, had to be there four years to figure out how to say that, um, uh, as one of their um, uh, advisors. And what I learned about Medicare, unlike when I went in there the first time, um, Medicare, they're very serious people. They're very smart people. They're very mathematically gifted and they're sitting there trying to figure out how to cover everyone over age 65 with very limited resources. And when you look at uh, what, they're, what they're really facing, uh, they've got a tax base, they've got uh, limits that are set by Congress, uh, and the healthcare expenditures just go up and up and up. And so these are the projections that you're seeing of what's going to happen to our country in terms of healthcare expenditures. It's, it's really not sustainable. It just isn't, okay? And so if you, the most recent data, the uh, Medicare trustees say that Medicare will be bankrupt in 2026, okay? If you look at the expenditures from Medicare, which are shown on this slide, or the frequency, who's, who's taking up the money, okay? It's hypertension. 58% of all Medicare beneficiaries have hypertension. That is the number one disease that our money is going to. If you, the last time I saw cost was actually uh, compiled uh, specifically for disease. It was actually in 2007. It was about 30% of the Medicare cost. If you extrapolate that to next year, where it's estimated that the Medicare expenditures will be about a trillion dollars, uh, and we go with 30% of that, that's a massive amount of money. That's unnecessarily spent. Uh, spent. Um, how about infrastructure, roads and bridges? How about free college tuition for everyone who's got above a C average. There's got to be other things that we could do with that money to improve our society other than spending it on a totally unnecessary disease. So this is my goal. Um, revise everything. Everybody changes their lifestyle. Everybody gets monitored. Everybody goes to their physician. And we actually uh, will reduce the incidence of blood pressure, not completely, but by 75%. I'll actually go through how it is that we could do that in a little bit. 75%, that would be my target. We would save 215, 216 billion dollars uh, that we could do a lot of other things with. Okay. Um, I have to say, it's, not, it's, it's number one, but it's not the only so-called volunteer disease. Uh, the diabetes, the strokes, um, losing your mental function, heart attack, sudden cardiac death, they're all things that we could fix if we work on nutrition and lifestyle. Okay. And so this was my, uh, my quote, and nobody says it anymore because I'm not president of the AC American College of Cardiology anymore, but I would still put it out there. Don't let your culture hold your heart hostage. Cigarette smoking, um, as well as the other, uh, uh, the, di the diabetes, high cholesterol, being overweight, uh, physically inactive, unhealthy diet, these are the things that we can, that we can have a dramatic improvement on uh, where we can actually make a decision today that we're going to work on these things and make them better as a, as a society. Okay, so let's go back to my clinic. <clears throat> I'm on the west side of Chicago now. I used to be on the south side, but our, our population is a little more Hispanic than it was when, when I was, and a little more Mandarin uh, uh, Chinese than it was when I was at the University of Chicago. But we still have a lot of African Americans, uh, many people with high blood pressure, and this is our, our, a good typical case, okay? Um, coming to cardiology, referred from primary care, uh, has no cardiac symptoms, and, but doesn't do any exercise program. He, because of the blood pressure, he had been a, 
advice to lower his sodium, saturated fat, and the diet. So he stopped adding salt to his diet. But he keeps going to his favorite soul food restaurant, not really recognize, not recognizing that the sodium is actually in what's being cooked, not just what you add at the table. Okay? Blood pressure, 160 over 92, um, and uh, came back, and after uh, changing the diet a little bit, 155 over 90, uh, and then 142 on home blood pressure monitoring. In the office, blood pressure, 148. Um, he's uh, overweight and uh, has really that fourth heart sound. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of that, and uh, it's using a stethoscope. I have to admit it's a, it's a lost art, um, but... Um, you can actually tell if a person has the heart issues uh, that the, the so-called target organ damage simply with a stethoscope by hearing that extra sound that the heart makes when it begins to get stiff from high blood pressure. Okay, so kidney function, fortunately good, but that hemoglobin A1C. So how many of you know what a hemoglobin A1C is? Almost everybody, yeah. So for those of you who don't, which is about half, uh, half the people, uh, I like to explain it to people um, in in sort of uh, uh, historical terms. You've all heard of, you've all seen a cornflake, right? And then you've seen a sugar frosted flake, right? So, <laughs> the, uh, not that you would eat either one of them, <laughs> but um, if you can imagine the difference between the two, imagine a red blood cell, and then a sugar frosted red blood cell. It turns out that red blood cells will take up sugar and become sugar coated. And depending on how much blood sugar there is. Well, it turns out that since the half-life of a uh, red blood cell is about a month, that means that you could actually draw uh, a test and measure how much sugar there is on a red blood cell, and it'll tell you approximately, on average, what the blood sugar's been for the past month or so. So it's actually a very helpful test. Um, and so when you have that, anything above 5.7% means that you're at least pre-diabetic, pre and if you're above 6.3%, then you actually are a diabetic. And so it's something that everyone should have if there's any question about diabetes. Uh, it's a test that everyone should, should know what their numbers are. Okay. The LDL cholesterol, in this case, was elevated. The triglycerides were elevated. So LDL cholesterol, that's the one that fills up the arteries uh, with plaque, causes heart attack and stroke. Triglyceride is really a marker of how, how well are you doing. If your triglycerides are ele elevated, you're basically either uh, genetically uh, problematic or most likely you're doing something wrong. Refined sugar, fried food, not exercising, alcohol. If you put all those things together, your triglycerides will go up. You see a lot of triglycerides go up in people who, who go vegan uh, because they start trying to get full off of things that are uh, rapidly absorbed um, uh, carbohydrates such as pasta, bagels, um, pretzels, and the triglycerides will go off the charts because you can, you know, you know triglycerides, you, you think of it as fat, well it is fat, and if you eat fat, your triglycerides will go up, but if you eat sugar, your liver will just make fat. And so you end up with uh, an issue there that really is a marker of bad things to come. Okay. Um, the rest of it, the EKG shows exactly what the, we would have imagined based on that exam uh, showing that the heart was stiff. You see that the voltages are high, and that says that there is thickness of the heart. Uh, and premature beats from the upper chamber, the, the atrium, that, again, is a reflection of the stiffness of the heart. So, still going with the lifestyle um, uh, advice and doing monitoring blood pressures at home. After eight weeks or so, uh, blood pressure at home is 138, uh, uh, much better. 138 over 70 with a range of 132 to 156. Okay, so, so I'm going to do some audience analysis. What, what do people think um, uh, we should be doing? Should we start medication at all? Uh, if we are going to start medication, what would be the indication? So, uh, who says that we should start uh, at 160 for the top number? Okay, I got one. All right, 150. That's a, that's a couple. 140. Okay, how about 130? All right, so we've got this. This will be a great discussion because we're all over the place. And physicians are in the same boat, uh, and so I'm going to go through the evidence. Okay, so now once you, so we decided, regardless of which level you voted for, um, once you start it, what is the 
target for the blood pressure. So we've got the threshold, where are we starting? But what is the target? Um, where do we want that blood pressure to go? Uh, how many say 150? No takers, okay. Glad to hear that, <laughs> okay. Okay, that's a, okay, 140? 130? 120? Everybody wants 120, interesting, okay, all right, okay. All right, so this is uh, a little too, uh, I see there are three people over there who can actually see <laughs> what that slide says. It's not shown to, sh uh, to put up for you to actually see the numbers unless you get the slides, which you're welcome to if uh, uh, Dr. Shore allows you to download them. They're fine with me, obviously. Uh, it's all public information and publications. But this is the number of guidelines. One, two, three, four, five, six, a bunch of guidelines, all saying uh, different things around the same topic, though. That you know that the target, you know, that the threshold, the target. Well, um, basically, we've had a lot of disagreement, um, and it's based on looking at evidence in different ways. Uh, to summarize it very quickly, um, there was a what a, we like to call a sort of a rogue guideline <laughs> that came out um, that told us that if you are over age 60, and I resemble that remark. Uh, that your blood pressure target would be 150, that you don't start medication unless lifestyle changes have failed to get you below 150. So 150 would be the, the uh, threshold for treatment and, and also the target. And um, we're very concerned about that. The people who wrote the document were not in agreement, and it's the first time in my career that there was a so-called minority report. For those of you who remember that movie, you know, there actually was um, uh, five out of the 17 guideline members who wrote up and said that the whole thing was completely wrong. Um, they went through the evidence table of why it was, and I'd actually lectured on this about eight times before it hit me what happened to them. Uh, and actually, I, I sent my little um, uh, epiphany uh, to the lead author of the Minority Report, and his jaw dropped, dropped as well. That is, what happened was that there were several studies that said if you were over age 60, that your outcome was not that different if your blood pressure was left at 150 or so. And so, but the problem was that that was controverted by a couple of studies that said, yeah, you really do need to, you, you will decrease stroke, you'll decrease heart failure, you'll decrease heart attack, if you treat below 150. So you have conflicting evidence, and you're talking about saving healthcare costs with drugs, saving side effects of drugs. So of course the committee would just say, well, okay, well, we're not going to try to over-treat people. The problem was, and the epiphany was, when you looked at those five different studies, the three that said um, that you don't need to treat, they were all less than three years. Now what does that really mean? Well, high blood pressure takes time to hurt you. And if you leave the blood pressure elevated for a long time, you will get more problems, more heart failure, more strokes, more heart attack. And if you only uh, take a look between now and two and a half years from now, you're not going to see enough events to make a difference. And so I think that is what really happened in that committee. They were looking at short-term evidence. So if you confine yourself to the longer-term evidence, then it's very clear that you need to get that blood pressure substantially lower and I hope that uh, anyone who's on a guideline or while uh, listening to this will remember that that's the evidence we want, not the evidence that's really short term. Okay, so um, moving forward, we did take into account the um, uh, longer term evidence and come up with a new guideline to try to get rid of that 150 issue. Um, as well as to summarize what is the, the best way of treating people, um, when do you start, uh, how, how long do you go with lifestyle, and I'd really like to summarize for you that new guideline, the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, but if you look at it, you don't just see my name, you see some really smart people uh, who have been given their lives to the study of hypertension. Uh, and the most important part of that slide is actually the fact that there are so many um, uh, organizations, Association of Black Cardiologists, American Society of, um, of Hypertension, that is, we brought in a broad spectrum of all kinds of stakeholders to try to make sure that this guideline was relevant to every population. Uh, and I hopefully we really did that. Okay, so 
Um, this is where the, uh, it was kind of nice to have the publication come out and then all of the arrows started coming right at us. Uh, and so uh, one of the major arrows is the idea that we really did change the definition of high blood pressure. And so uh, it used to be that we were talking about uh, less than 130 <coughs> was pre-hypertension. Uh, we got rid of that. We now say, and I think uh, based on this audience, uh, a lot of people did go with this because you were all looking for that really low blood pressure <laughs> on, this, on the case where we voted. Um, normal is less than 120. If you're one, more than 120 or 120 or greater, that's elevated. If you're more than 130, that's stage one hypertension. Uh, and then stage two is above 140 and you're gonna do poorly. We need to, to move quickly. Okay. Now, one of the first things that happened is that we, we were, uh, despite the fact that none of us had any relationships with industry, um, it turns out that a lot of uh, arrows were being shot at us saying that this was just trying to increase the number of drugs that were being sold uh, by changing the uh, definition of high blood pressure. Well, first of all, that meant they didn't read the document because as you and I are gonna go through uh, momentarily, we talk more about lifestyle uh, than anything else. And if you look at, at it, the number, if you really do the lifestyle, the number of people shown on this slide, the number of people who are treated with drugs goes up a tiny amount uh, compared to the number of people who are diagnosed. Uh, because we really are not talking uh, primarily about drugs. Okay, now there are some people um, where you really shouldn't spend a lot of time doing a lifestyle alone. Everyone needs to do lifestyle changes. But uh, where is it that you shouldn't do it alone? It's people who have target organ damage already and people who have a lot of risk, okay? And so the diabetic, coronary heart disease, chronic kidney disease, um, with the blood pressure of more than 130, we do the lifestyle and the drugs. And we, can we get the person off the drugs? Certainly. Uh, some of them are more effective than others. It depends on how plant-based you become, uh, how seriously you take the exercise. And we're going to go through each piece of those evidence. And the evidence that I will show you is all additive. And so if you fix this thing and that thing, you can add up the differences that you're going to get. And uh, many people actually are, almost everyone who is on blood pressure medicine, who takes the lifestyle changes we're gonna talk about seriously, their blood pressure medication requirement goes down and sometimes they come off. And that, that's very common in my practice. Okay, so um, one of the major issues that we went through is can we get an accurate blood pressure? Um, it is a kind of annoying that you, every time you measure your blood pressure, you get a different number. Well, part of that's just normal physiology. That is, when you breathe, your blood pressure changes, okay? So keep breathing, okay? It's, it's important. Um, but you try to get people um, to, uh, that's my mom calling. Okay, so, so all right. I'll, she'll leave a voicemail. No, no worries. Okay. All right. Um, so we want to make sure that the patient is having blood pressures if they're going to be done in the office, and I'm putting a big if on that uh, for reasons that we'll talk about. Um, you want to have the patient calm. You don't want them dealing with the fact that there was no space in the parking lot and they went around five times, um, that the expressway was difficult getting there. You want to give them a little bit of time. Um, make sure that you're using a really good technique um, making sure that the patient is, is seated, uh, upright position, arms relaxed, and, and measure it several times and do the average. That really is the best way to try to get consistent office blood pressures. But out of office blood pressure monitoring is one of the major messages that I have for anyone who's listening to what our guidelines have to say about hypertension. And I will spend a lot of time talking about this, okay? So, um, so how many people here, I wanna say, either have high blood pressure, had high blood pressure, know somebody with high blood pressure, or if concerned about high blood pressure? Everybody in the room, right? That means that you should have a blood pressure cuff at home, okay? So let's do it. How many people here have a blood pressure cuff? Right. Fantastic, it's only 75% of you. Why am I holding up four fingers? Because I have four blood pressure cuffs at home, <laughs> okay. All right, and so, um, so it's something that everyone should be doing um, to monitor uh, exactly what's going on. 
You should monitor your blood pressure very frequently unless it's just so stable and never changes and there are very few people uh, in whom that happens. Um, it, it sort of has taken a while for this to catch on, but now we have the European Society, uh, NICE, which is the, um, uh, the United Kingdom, we have pretty much everyone on board now saying that home blood pressure mon monitoring is an important thing to do because it, it, the data has been out there for a while, but the practice has been very, very slim, okay? Um, we actually want to uh, make sure that people are, are trained, that they understand that they want to use it in, in the upper arm, although there are risk cuffs that are perfectly well validated, and you want to make sure that uh, the person is uh, measuring them multiple times. You try to do a, a sort of a seven-day period where you're measuring and you sort of get used to it, and doing two or three measurements is, is a good idea if it's a person who is very anxious about measuring their blood pressure, which many people are, you're gonna get an artificially high reading, and then I'd say take it three times, or take it until you're bored, but I'd take it at least three times, and take the third one, uh, or the last one, as the real blood pressure. If you're not particularly anxious about it, then just do three of them and do the average, okay? Uh, doing it sitting after five minutes with the arm resting at heart level. So yes, just gravity, can fake your blood pressure low if your arm cuff is way above your heart, uh, or it can fake it high if it's below your heart. So your blood pressure plus gravity, okay? Trying to make sure that you're not doing uh, cigarettes or coffee uh, right um, before the measurement is, is important as well. Why are we doing this now? <coughs> Excuse me. The data is shown here that if you compare the uh, outcomes based on the blood pressure of uh, that how, much, how many events do people have, and you're comparing that with the blood pressure, okay, you'll see that it's much more meaningful to have a blood pressure that's elevated at night, that is at home. Uh, on a 24-hour monitor, the worst thing that we have is a conventional office blood pressure, even though that's the way uh, everyone has been managed for blood pressure for decades. It's the, the least helpful of all. Okay, and here we go. Okay, you can compare them and you find out that what you have in the clinic may not be what you have at home. And the nighttime blood pressure is actually pretty important. There are ambulatory monitors that'll sort of just very quietly do your blood pressure at night. Why even bother with that? It's the, on, the idea of dipping, that there are dippers and non-dipping, uh, non-dippers. Uh, who are the non-dippers? Well, what is dipping? Well, first of all, uh, if your blood pressure is you know, typically 125 during the day, then it's probably going to be closer to 115 at night. There's sort of what we call a diurnal variation in blood pressure. Blood pressure falls at night naturally. There are people where it doesn't fall. And so this is the answer to the age-old question of you've got one patient whose blood pressure is you know, 140 in your office and they seem to be fine. You've got another one's blood pressure is 140 in the office and their kidneys are bad and they've got the fourth heart sound and the EKG shows you know, damage and all this stuff. And so what's the difference between the two? How about the, the nighttime blood pressure? So whose blood pressure doesn't fall at night? Uh, African Americans, that'd be number one. And it's, it's not African genes, apparently because it's urban and rural African Americans. It's urban Africans, but not rural Africans that tend to have non-dipping blood pressures. So it's something about society, something about perhaps uh, you know, healthcare disparities and uh, econo socioeconomic status. Um, but as you move up the uh, socioeconomic ladder, it doesn't actually improve. And so um, then there's obesity is a major issue. Uh, particularly if there's sleep apnea, you end up with a lot of changes uh, that happen because of sleep apnea. Blood pressure can be extremely high, heart rate going up, rhythm disturbances, heart rate going very low. Um, and so nocturnal or nighttime high blood pressure is something that we all should be concerned about if you have one of those risk factors. Okay. Um, so if we could get everyone's blood pressure controlled uh, day and night, uh, that would be exactly what we're hoping to do. And let's see. Okay. I think I hear a question. What's that? So I, I actually, I can't quite hear you, but um, 
they gave me an hour and a half, and I promised to go an hour. <laughs> so, uh, at least I promised myself, so that we could do all the questions at the end, because I'm, I'm sure they're going to give you a microphone, because I really can't quite hear you. I do hear the fans, but <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, so, uh, but you'll hold on to it? You promise? Okay, 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 we'll write it down, okay, all right, uh, or just if you really, uh, you could come on up if I, I just can't hear you. Um, so, oh, this question is whether or not older people are non-dippers, they certainly can be, um, but the, the ones that mostly have identified, some uh, Asians, particularly Southeast Asians, African Americans, and obesity are, are the biggest risk factors, okay. All right, and so, um, so bottom line on our high blood pressure readings out of the office, really important. Uh, our guideline talks about using it more and more. Why? Uh, it's these two things, white coat hypertension and mast hypertension. If you don't do blood pressures out of the office, you'll never recognize that these two things ex exist. Now, how many people here have heard of white coat or office hypertension? Everyone, right. How many people have heard of mast hypertension? Very few. So what is it? Okay. So uh, it's a sad commentary on society, but there are places, particularly like the south side of Chicago, uh, some gangs, some drugs, uh, uh, scary neighborhoods, an older person typically, living alone, uh, perhaps. Um, sometimes it's elder abuse, but you will find places where the time that they feel the most secure is where, when they're in the 11th floor of Rush University Professional Building in the cardiology office. They're surrounded by people who like them, who are being kind to them, and their blood pressure is substantially lower than it is at home. As sad as that is, that's mass hypertension, and it's actually fairly common. And so if we look at it, um, at the white coat effect, um, the blood pressure are higher at, um, in the office than they are out of the hospital. Masked, uncontrolled hypertension, uh, where the blood pressure is out of control at home but not in the office, they actually have substantial meaning. That is, the masked hypertension, which is estimated to be somewhere between 13 to 30 percent of our older patients, um, really has a big impact because you're missing it completely. You're missing an opportunity to treat someone um, and to, to work on getting the blood pressure down because you don't know about it, and this is the data. Um, those are uh, survival plots without an or with an event, and you see the biggest difference at the top is uh, having a blood pressure that's normal in the office but elevated at home and then treating that person, you have a dramatic effect on their bad outcome. Okay, so mass hypertension. So we talk about that in the guideline, and you know the the algorithm is just simple logic. You make sure that you have your office blood pressure if it's elevated or normal. You then go ahead and do them at home as well. Uh, and if you have uh, elevated blood pressure at home, you treat that uh, very seriously. Okay, um, so we talked about. Uh, actually, this is a, a slide we can move on. I'm going to talk more about the um, non-pharmacologic measures, and these are the most, probably the most important aspect of the guidelines. We want to talk about the things that people can do to change their blood pressure um, before even approaching drugs, unless the blood pressure has been so bad for so long that you better start with drugs, as, as, uh, we, dis as we discussed. Weight loss, sodium reduction, being physically active, not so much alcohol, never cigarettes. If we do that, we do pretty well. So what do we actually get? Um, if you lose weight, you can get 5 to 20 milli uh, milligrams, um, I'm sorry, millimeters of mercury off your blood pressure. The DASH eating pattern, um, which is a lot of fruits and vegetables and uh, Low-fat dairy was included. I know a lot of us wouldn't do that, but that's the way the study was done, and that's the randomized trial uh, data. So that has a large impact, up to 14 millimeters. Um, the, the, getting the sodium uh, down and making sure that it's uh, as low as, uh, that's, that you can reasonably make it has good data. Uh, physical activity as well, at least 30 minutes per day, which is uh, hopefully... Uh, something that everyone can do, and moderating the alcohol consumption. Okay, 
Now, if you look at the data for that, uh, these are so-called, and when you write guidelines, you're supposed to say what the level of evidence at LOE is and what, how high uh, the, re uh, the recommendation ranks. And these are all 1A recommendations, meaning that, that there is plenty of high quality evidence okay, for each of these uh, aspects. So no question about it that's, that that's what we should be doing. And they're additive. Okay, so you lose the weight, blood pressure can fall a good four or five millimeters. The, I would put the in green, of course, uh, the more fruits and vegetables, 11, maybe even 14 millimeters. How much sodium should be in your diet? This is argued back and forth by multiple guidelines. We're saying less than 1,500 milligrams per day. Uh, how about potassium? Adding potassium and adding it up to, so that you're up around 3,500 milligrams per day uh, is really good. So, and so, you know, I, people look at the DASH diet. So I threw this slide in, uh, published by the DASH diet people. Again, randomized trial, looked at a lot of people, looked at the outcomes, and what they were able to see is that the drop in blood pressure really depends on how much of a fruit and vegetable diet you're actually doing. Is it new? No, this goes back to the Kempner Rice diet back in the 1930s, okay? But the data is very clear that the more fruits and vegetables you do in the DASH diet, um, meaning less animal products, the lower the blood pressure gets. But focusing on them lowers the blood pressure. Now, what's the evidence outside of DASH? There's plenty. So this is actually put together by Neil Barnard's group, um, and there they are. And again, I know there's only three people over there who can see every, the names of the authors. You don't have to see the names, just see that the number of studies that say that if you do a vegetarian diet, uh, and even a wide variety of kinds of vegetarian diets, you will lower your blood pressure, okay? But the more plant-based you are, the better. Don't wanna skip the physical activity part. Aerobic exercise, uh, dynamic resistance exercise, isometric exercise, believe it or not, they all lower the blood pressure four to five millimeters of mercury, and they are additive. So spend some time in the gym uh, focusing on it. And moderating alcohol intake, uh, less than one drink per, per day for women, less than two drinks for, uh, per day for men. Uh, that can actually, if you, a person is drinking more than that, you can get another four millimeters of mercury off uh, the blood pressure. So um, we really do want to do uh, lifestyle as much as possible. And once you've, you've maximized uh, everything that you can do with that, then we start drugs, okay? And it's worth talking about because there are some differences between what we said about drugs and it's, these are things that lay people should understand because not every doctor has actually read our guidelines and you might wanna give them a copy, okay, sometimes. Um, but it's really important uh, to make sure that that blood pressure is low if the person is at higher risk. That is, the more uh, risk factors you have, the more targeted organ damage, the more you should be using drugs early. Um, and the, we make sure that we're trying to prevent cardiovascular disease if a person has a 10-year risk um, of more than 10%, okay? Now, what is that 10%? Uh, has everybody heard of the American College of Cardiology ASCVD calculate, risk calculator? Anybody, anybody? This, this one, okay. So you can, uh, two, great. You can actually, it's an app for your, uh, for your phone that you can download that is a great party tool, okay? You pull it out and you say, what's your blood pressure? What was your last cholesterol? What's the HDL, what's the LDL? Uh, how old are you? Are you African American? It asks all the questions, diabetic, smoking, et cetera. And at the end, you push the button and it tells you your 10 year risk of heart attack, stroke, and death, okay? And so why would you do that at a party? Because that's the only way we're going to get a hold of this uh, is to let people who are, uh, are at risk know. So we actually do this at Rush uh, with a community program, with the, with the app. We did Veggie Fest a couple of times. We go into churches. Uh, we ask people to sign up. Come on. We do a blood test. Uh, find out if your hemoglobin A1C is elevated. What's your blood pressure? Put all those things in. Uh, we call it the uh, Helping Everyone Assess Risk Today, which, of course, spells heart. Uh, and uh, that app is incredibly useful uh, to try to tell people who, who ought to be going back and seeing their doctors sooner rather than later. Okay, so 
if you do your little app and your risk is more than 10%, you should be treated early, okay? Uh, there's a picture of the uh, output. because You can actually get it. It doesn't have to be the app. You can get it online as well. Uh, you can put in the data online. It's not going to store it or anything like that and tell you exactly what your risk is. So, so hopefully everyone will look, look it up, ACCAHA risk calculator, and, uh, and go ahead and do your own risk. Okay? All right. Um, so how about, I'm sorry, go back to it? Okay. <coughs> sure, take a picture or just type it in, ACCAHA risk calculator. Okay. I see a lot of shutter bugs out there. This is, this is good. All right. Uh, they're going to wonder when they see the spike in the uh, activity. <laughs> uh, but yes, you should, that, this would be a, a great uh, gift for all your friends for Groundhog Day. <laughs> okay. uh, send them a link to, the, to, to measure their risk. Okay, got it? Okay. All right. All right. Let's talk about the blood pressure goal. Again, uh, it really depends on the risk. If the person has a higher risk, more than 10% risk, those are the people where you want the blood pressure to be less than 130. Okay? Uh, if you have uh, other markers for increased risk, uh, if particularly the cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, you really do everything, and this, they're all shown on this slide, and nice to take a picture of it. Uh, you find yourself and your friends on this slide. Diabetes, uh, chronic kidney disease. Uh, the only one where you give a little bit of room is actually uh, the third line from the bottom. If you have had a stroke already, you, there obviously is some concern about dropping the blood pressure too soon. Okay, after a stroke, you want the blood pressure to stay a little bit higher, but not for long. Um, so, but if you're doing this for stroke um, prevention, uh, you use a threshold of 140. Okay, if you have no disease whatsoever, you also use 140 if your risk is low. But other than that, pretty much you're using 130 as the as the threshold for starting therapy, um, and the blood pressure goal is going to be less than 130 for everyone. Okay, um, Medications. Now, this one is probably something you would think, why would a doctor come and start talking to mostly lay people um, uh, about, uh, about drugs? Well, it's mostly because we have a problem with this. The data has changed. Uh, Dr. Shore mentioned this uh, in the, the little disclaimer that everything changes all the time. The way I t t tend to say it is that, you know, medical knowledge uh, doubles every two years, and in cardiology it seems to double every year. And things that we used to do two years ago are just not right anymore. And so it is important for everyone who is on a drug that we're no longer supposed to be using that they go back to their doctor and say, hey, did you look at the ACCAHA guidelines? And I think this is one of the ways that we can help doctors help their patients is by keeping them informed um, because, you know, they're dealing with a whole lot of stuff and they may not be focusing on this one tiny little guideline, which I think is the biggest guideline. Okay. All right. So uh, with that said, um, we do much more with calcium channel blockers than we did with the previous guidelines. Um, and they are pretty prominent in most of uh, uh, folks' guidelines uh, from around the world. And so there's a lot of agreement about that. But that middle column, beta blockers, no more beta blockers. Now, there are a couple of them that do pretty well, but most of them we don't do. Um, so if you haven't heard of a beta blocker, good, okay? If you have um, heard of it, uh, there are all the drugs that end in LOL, but it really isn't laugh out loud, okay? Um, but if you're on particularly metoprolol or atenolol, these are drugs that we have tried to remove from the use of uh, uh, for high blood pressure. There are plenty of good reasons to be on those drugs. And sometimes a person with high blood pressure is on those drugs because of something else. I could just try to list them for you, but the list is incredibly long. There are aortic aneurysms, a person who has heart failure, a person who has rhythm disturbance from the upper chamber, rhythm disturbance for the lower chamber, migraine headaches, essential tremor, stage fright. There's loads of reasons to use beta blockers, just not hypertension, okay? All right. Um, 
Then the, the next thing that we dealt with, which is a common question that everyone who has high blood pressure has to um, sort of make this choice along with their doctor, is do you start with one drug uh, and then escalate up that drug until you get to some side effect or something, or do you start with combination drugs? Well, it turns out that the best evidence is for using lower doses of combination drugs rather than trying to escalate um, uh, a single drug up to some level where it gives you real problems. So if you combine uh, drugs from different classes, it's actually five times more effective at lowering blood pressure than just adding a second agent. You know, even though we, we did that for 40 years, um, it turns out that that's not the best way to do it. Okay. Um, so in terms of th thresholds and recommendations, I think you've got the idea that we're going to take most of our population. We start uh, after we've done everything we can with lifestyle, unless they have target organ damage, then we're doing it early on. Uh, that's the summary of, of this algorithm slide. Uh, if there's, and it's nice to take a picture of it or you can look it up online because uh, it really is helpful to people, uh, their families, and their physicians. Okay. All right, so um, I'm going to, uh, the last couple of lines here are about the follow-up. That is, no one has ever really talked about, you know, you kind of learn it in medical school, you learn it as a, you know, internal medicine training. When do you follow up a patient, you know, who has high blood pressure? You've made an intervention, it could be cut the sodium, exercise every day, or I'm starting you on, you know, a combination drug pill, when do you follow them up? Well, you really should be following them up fairly, uh, much sooner than we used to. I'm not going to start you on a drug and say, thanks, come back in six months. Okay? I need to know within several weeks that um, your blood pressure is under control or I need to make, make the next move. Okay? So hopefully we're rolling that backwards a little bit and we're, we're trying to see at least on a monthly basis uh, that the patient is, is controlled. And how do we determine control? With it home blood pressure or office blood pressure? Home, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so we have been uh, heavily criticized uh, for, I'm doing pretty well on this. Okay, so we have been heavily criticized for changing that threshold. I want to just, and your physician, when you, know, you bring your mom to the doctor and the blood pressure is 135 and they tell you that's okay, um, you want to be able to fight that battle a little bit. Talk about the SPRINT trial, okay, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple years ago. And they actually did try 140, which was the standard uh, target before, versus 120, okay, which was like almost unheard of. Okay? And so the SPRINT uh, trial actually enrolled a lot of people, had a lot of people who were older, which was the major concern. Uh, it had uh, really the good demographics between all of the groups that were, that were studied. Intensive therapy versus uh, standard therapy, 120 for the target versus uh, 140. And if you look at the primary outcome, what you see is that going for 120, they didn't make it, they made it to 121. Um, the, the standard group, uh, were, they undershot 140 they got to an average of 136. So, you know, in concept, it was 120 versus 140. In reality, it was 121 versus 136. And yet you saw a dramatic reduction in heart failure, in cardiovascular death, total mortality, okay? All of them uh, substantially reduced. Death from any cause, uh, death of, of any kind of cardiovascular disease, all of them were reduced. And so people, and there are a lot of people who say that the study was flawed, that our guidelines are flawed, that blood pressure should be 150 if you're over 60. They're still saying that. It's mostly primary care, not cardiology, not kidney doctors, um, not ne neurologists okay, who deal with the strokes. It turns out that um, uh, the data is fairly strong, that this is uh, something that if you do this for your patients, you will get better outcomes. Uh, the, what... The change in outcome is actually related to how much you change the blood pressure. And so this is a complicated, a lot of statistics on this slide uh, showing you 
the marked improvement in outcome, if you take the highest blood pressure and you get it down to that 120 to 124 range, you get the best outcome. Okay. Okay. So what is the pushback? It's about older people that if you give them enough drugs, uh, you get the blood pressure lower than 130, that they're all going to pass out and they're going to hit their heads and they're going to have, you know, they're going to break their hip and that they're going to die faster. That basically is the idea of leaving older people with higher blood pressures. Well, as you saw, the SPRINT trial had a lot of people who were over 75. And when you looked at the outcomes, what you saw is that the death rate was substantially lower if the blood pressure was lower. Okay? And so then you take the data and you divide it into three groups. People who are frail, people who are not frail, and people who are in between. And guess what? The death rate was lower in all three groups. So there, there really is no one, I'm not, you know, I, I'm saying no one in general, but in a particular office visit with a patient, um, the thing that I like to do if I'm co concerned about the blood pressure being too low is make sure, <coughs> excuse me, make sure that you're measuring the blood pressure sitting and standing uh, because a lot of older people will get dizzy when they stand up because the blood vessels are stiff and the blood pressure drops a lot when they stand up. And so uh, if that's the major concern, then you have to be a little bit, in, in an individual case, you have to be a little bit more um, careful with the, with the therapy and leave the blood pressure sitting a little higher so that people are not getting dizzy and falling. But in general, you really should be going lower. Um, and so uh, adults over age 65, um, we try to, uh, particularly if they have a lot of uh, issues going on, we try to get the blood pressure uh, down below 130, but uh, you have to make those as individual decisions uh, for, and assess a person's risk benefit on an individual basis. That's really uh, what our guidelines say. Uh, what, are the, what are the things that happen? People passing out, people falling, getting really low heart rates, getting electrolyte, uh, you know, potassium, sodium issues, having acute kidney injury. Does it happen if you use the drugs? Yeah, but you're saving people's lives at the same time. You know, so, but it, whenever we're using a lot of drugs in the older population, we have to bring them back and, and measure everything to make sure that we're not over-treating. Uh, because we really don't want people uh, passing out and falling. Uh, ultimately, if you look at the intensive therapy in SPRINT for the older people versus the standard therapy, there really were not a lot of differences uh, based on, that, uh, uh, on the blood pressure. The fact that you're using drugs is going to cause some kidney injury in some people while you're saving their life. <laughs> and um, the reversible, or I'm sorry, non-reversible kidney injury where somebody ends up on dialysis, extremely rare. Uh, you're going to save more people from dialysis than you're going to cause by a lot. Okay. Um, this is actually a summary of what I just said. Uh, acute AKI is acute kidney injury. It does happen, um, uh, but uh, permanent kidney injury, really not very common. And so the, the, re the kidney function actually does improve, and changing the, the blood pressure threshold didn't seem to make an impact on that. Okay. So... Um, uh, I've gone through a lot of stuff, and I, I, I recognize that some of it's foreign material, but there are sort of the four major uh, take-home points. Um, if there are questions about blood pressure, we've tried as much as we can to answer them in the, uh, the 2017 hypertension guideline. Uh, the biggest update would be that the blood pressure level for prompting treatment uh, we've reduced it from 140 in the old guidelines to 130 now uh, for those who are less than 60 and from 150 in the people who are over 60, again, down to 130. That we're really aiming uh, with the lifestyle therapy uh, to get a blood pressure less than 130. If it's not working, then we do use drug, 30, uh, drug therapy, again, targeting less than 130. And we remember that we have to treat the patients sooner if they have a high risk uh, of cardiovascular disease, such as diabetes, chronic kidney disease, or if they already have um, uh, target organ damage, or now that you all have your ACC risk calculator, 
more than a 10% 10-year risk. All right. Um, what's going to be the impact of our guidelines? Well, we've, they've been out of about a year, uh, a year and a quarter now. Uh, hopefully, we're, we're going to see a lot more reliance on home blood pressures, uh, not being treated just by, by what happens in the office because we don't want to miss the mass hypertension or overtreat the people with office hypertension. Uh, but when you look at the implications for treatment, you will have a lot more people uh, who will require uh, medication, but it's a small percentage compared to the number of people uh, who are diagnosed with hypertension because we have a much greater emphasis on lifestyle modification. Okay. And with that, I want to say thank you and open it up for questions. Yes, sir. Um, actually, I could, I could share this one. But, uh, but you want to be the designated uh, mic runner? Great, OK. So you get to start, and then OK. I want to sit down. My blood pressure is 117 over about 70, which I, I thought I was cool. Mm -hmm. But my resting heart rate is about 80. I don't think that's so great. And one more thing, for a 60-year-old man who um, is doing OK, do you think a CT scan of the heart is a good idea? Plant-based 60-year-old man? So that's a whole bunch of questions, actually, yeah, that, sorry, that sorry. everybody's going to want to know. OK. So is 117 good? Absolutely. Is the heart rate of 80? Yeah, you know, everyone would like to have that heart rate of 45. Actually, uh, he's got it. Okay. Um, it looks like you're off the hook. <laughs> okay. Um, and so uh, people are concerned about the heart rate of 80. It'd be nice to know what your heart rate variability is, uh, whether or not you're having extra beats. Um, you know, uh, I know most people are familiar with the fact that the watches now will do heart rates for you and give you an average heart rate. Um, Everyone would like to have that marathon or heart rate of 45, um, but it's really not necessary. And when do you start to get this concerned about the heart rate? It's if it's more than 100. Uh, so 80 isn't that bad. It might be an indicator, depending on how much exercise you're doing, that you're doing more you know, isometric and resistance exercise than you are endurance exercise. The endurance athletes are the ones who tend to have the much uh, lower heart rates. So I wouldn't be so concerned about that. So then the, the issue of um, uh, CT scanning, all right? It is one of the favored uh, tests that is completely underutilized. It's typically not paid for by insurance, okay? But the coronary calcium score is incredibly predictive. And I didn't go into it in here, but we actually do use it for prevention. That coronary calcium score, you can sort of uh, use that as a risk predictor. It is more, more accurate than just adding up risk factors and putting them in the, the little app, okay? Uh, and it's inexpensive. Uh, most places have it for $49. Rush University is 95 but, uh, and you end up paying out of pocket. But at the end of it, you do get a score. So who should have it? Um, that's where people will differ. And I would say that if you're concerned that you have disease, and that's where it comes into our guidelines. If you're concerned that you should be treated or having more diagnostic tests, uh, like a stress test or, or the like, uh, that's when it's really a good idea to do it, if you have risk factors. Um, and if you say American person, male, uh, over 60, that is actually quite reasonable. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> Thanks for the wonderful rapport you gave us. It was very helpful. I have a question for you. <coughs> I've been on a, a high blood pressure medication for an Avaprel for 18 years, and all of a sudden, my blood pressure has started to rise to 150, 160, over 91, over 80. But you did mention something in reference to apnea. apnea. <laughs> Sleep apnea? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, how do you treat, well, I'm thinking that perhaps my blood pressure went up because of the sleep apnea, because I have been diagnosed with that. So mm -hmm. I thought maybe that's the reason for it. But does that mean that they treat it with heart medications? Or is, could it be that the heart pressure, uh, my blood pressure has gone up because of the apnea? 
So if I, I try to... Because I'm already on medication. So, well, so I, I'm going to go with the principles because we're not supposed to do a, a doctor patient okay, thing okay, from up here. Okay, okay. so we'll remove the my part and just talk about uh, sleep apnea. It's really Correct. important. Uh, it's a, and how you it's treat a, it. It's an issue that's on the rise because of our obesity epidemic. Okay, you're not... Uh, not you personally, but uh, but there are people who are not obese who have it as well. Um, and the best way in, uh, to try to realize that is to have someone tell you that you're doing a lot of snoring, okay? Having daytime sleepiness is another one, and then high blood pressure as well as rhythm disturbances. So if these are all very important signs that you may be struggling with that particular condition. Now, what do you do about it? Most important thing is to do a sleep study. That is a technology that's dramatically changing. At the last heart meeting, this, tell me where um, this is uh, February, so that was the American Heart Association. Um, there was a company who had a device that you just take home and you hook yourself up, and then it tells you uh, it tells you everything. It tells you what happened to your heart rate. It tells you what happened to your blood pressure. How what happened to your oxygen level. And it gives you the decibels of how loud you snore okay, at different times it was, and, and how, how often there's no air exchange. Um, so that's completely different than what we've been doing in the past with the sleep centers and everybody has to sort of disrupt their life and go and sleep in this lab, what they you know, don't feel comfortable sleeping in. Um, so we've really got uh, new techniques. Now the question is, what do you do about it once you find out that you've got a high number of decibels and you're snoring really badly and then you stop breathing because you're completely obstructed. Um, that's changing as well. So it used to be just that big uh, uh, CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure mask, and you would titrate it. Do you need five centimeters of water? Do you need 10 centimeters? What do you need to keep your airway open? And how do you sleep with this thing on? And my patients, I don't, you know, I'm not a pulmonologist. I don't treat people, but I have, it interacts with cardiology a lot. And I can tell you that I got 50-50 uh, in our patients. People get CPAP and they say, I absolutely can't stand it. I can't sleep with it. I'll never do it. I'd rather die. And other people say, oh my gosh, that's the best sleep I've ever had in my life. And so um, the good the, for this side of people who really don't like it, there are new masks, there are mouth guards, there are all sorts of new devices um, that people are working on to try to get people much more comfortable, better fits uh, and better equipment. And so I'm glad to see that technology take off. Um, so uh, bottom line would be, um, I was starting to say for you, but we're not doing a you. Okay, <laughs> so the best thing to do is to find a local sleep uh, specialist, okay? And we certainly have them at Rush University if you wanna fly over to Chicago. And, uh, and right, so, uh, so if you, and so you might want to consider if uh, making sure that it's working. And if, if you're not having the problem with sleep apnea, then it's not contributing to your blood pressure anymore. Okay. So you got two people standing in line there, but then we got five people with their hands raised. So I don't know. Okay. Okay. So were you in line, sir? No, you weren't? Okay. <laughs> oh, so the, the question up here was principles of long life. <laughs> okay. Um, that is, so it's, I, I kind of tease people. Uh, everybody asks me, because I'm in a lot of nutrition conferences, what should I be eating? I say, I don't know. All I know is what not to eat. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, and so I'm. What, uh, so I would say stick to cardiology. That's first of all, uh, cardiovascular stuff. And it really would be if I had to pick uh, out the things to do, it'd be exactly the hypertension talk that I gave. So you're probably wondering why am I even going to try to answer that question? It's so not off topic. It's not off topic because I think all of the principles were actually on that lifestyle slide. Okay, uh, that is. Um, uh, lowering sodium in your diet, increasing the potassium in your diet, exercising with a multiple modalities. Where do we do it? At least 150 minutes per week. If you're uh, doing, if you're normal, if you are treating anything, more than 300 minutes a week. Doing completely plant-based diet. If you had to do low-fat dairy, it, you know, it, you'll, it, they'll be better off than you would with an with a uh, an American diet. 
uh, and, in, and drinking uh, less alcohol and, and losing weight. If people are ideal body weight, exercising daily, plant-based nutrition, uh, that's going to give you your best life. Now, I mean, I'm sure you've heard real experts, but I can tell you what I've learned sitting in these conferences. There are other things like uh, being happily married, not just married, but happily married, uh, having a pet. Um, of, if I had to pick the one with the biggest numerical change, it's tennis. Okay. Uh, 42% decrease, it's a British medical journal about eight months ago. Uh, racket sports in general, but ten tennis specifically, lowers your mortality. Um, so happiness and long life, you know, uh, so have be surrounded by love and play a lot of tennis. Well, Plant-based uh, nutrition. Question. I have, oh, I, I have heard that blood pressure medications work better if taking at night. And if that's the case, do they stay in your body for 24 hours? Uh, yeah, so, um, so now you're really going to get me going. Uh, so the issue is, um, when do you do the blood pressure therapy? Do you do morning or evening? A lot of the, not, the nighttime, trading, taking the picture or taking the blood pressure pills before you go to bed, um, there is small amounts of data that say that that improves uh, the outcomes. I'm much more concerned, however, about um, people, physicians, not knowing how long the drug lasts. Let me just take one class and give you one example. That would be the angiotensin receptor blockers. They end in sartan. So there's telmasartan, there's uh, losartan, valsartan became famous recently because there was poison in it, and hopefully everyone heard about the recall of valsartan. Then you found out that it was in losartan and irbisartan. Uh, don't worry, there's eight of them on the market, okay? So three of them going bad, not to worry. Um, but my big concern is that people don't know how long those drugs last. So it turns out that losartan is the number one drug, it's the least expensive, and it has a half-life of two hours, and you take it once a day? Now, if you take it once a day, how long would you like it to last? Maybe 24 hours? And that would be telmasartan. And the problem with telmasartan is it's a little more expensive. Why? Because it's got the best outcome study, so the generic people charge more for it. Um, and a lot of companies don't, uh, insurance companies don't want to pay for it. Um, so bottom line is, uh, that's just one example from one class of drugs. Uh, what I would encourage everybody to do is just go on their search engine and take the drug that they're taking, okay, uh, particularly if it's once a day, and say the name of that drug, like Losartan, Half-Life. And if it's something that's short, make sure that your blood pressure is controlled right before you take it. So that would be sort of, <coughs> excuse me, the lowest level that it's ever gonna be is right before you take your next pill. And if your blood pressure is controlled, then don't worry about what I'm saying, okay? If the blood pressure is not controlled, uh, and it's con I mean, so what, what am I really saying? Is that that whole thing that we do, having patients get up in the morning, take their blood pressure, medication, drive to the clinic, sit in the office waiting for me for an hour, okay? <laughs> All right? And so I'm about two hours after they've taken their drug, and then I measure their blood pressure. Well, that's giving the best, putting the best foot forward for that drug but it may not be for the best for the patient uh, because what happens after that, late evening, uh, after they get into an argument with the, with the boss in the office, you really want to know the blood pressure all over uh, and have drugs that are going to last a long time. So thanks for that question. My question is um, a person who has high blood pressure, they have done all the lifestyle changes, and um, it's recommended by their doctor that they go on some type of blood pressure medication. How can a person feel comfortable going on these medications? There have been so many recalls. So, well, if you look at, first of all, the entire breadth of, uh, of cardiovascular medicine, the number of recalls has been very few. So 2018, you know, the Valsartan, the Irbisartan, Losartan. The other one was uh, Lipitor in November of 2012, where somebody put glass in the 20 and 40 milligrams. Uh, but that's, there really aren't a lot of drug recalls in cardiovascular medicine. And these are, these are drugs that have dramatic improvement in, in outcomes. And you, you, you saw it in the SPRINT trial. You treat people. What was the difference, by the way, between uh, the 140 group and the 120 group? It was essentially 0.9 more drugs. 
okay? So an average of, you know, uh, of three drugs versus two drugs. And it really made a difference. And you, if you're talking about not just lives, we're talking about brains. Um, and so being able to uh, save events means that people should be taking their medications and don't be afraid of them, but stay abreast of, of what's going on. Uh, none of this stuff happens you know, in a closet. You're seeing, you, know, you, you get news reports, just pay attention, and if everybody's uh, you know, listening to their doctors and sometimes informing their doctors, um, you won't be taking a drug that has a, a recall. Would it, you know, to, my real answer would be, it would be great if we had a system that was so electronic that the moment there was a recall of your drug, you instantly got an email. And I bet we get there because we have e-prescribing. It's not that hard to, to make that happen. You know, there's a lady, I don't know who has the microphone, but there's a lady who's with the, in the back, and I'm so concerned oh. that her arm is going to become okay, ischemic. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Is this one for the mic? Hello, thank you for your concern. I was just stretching. No, um, <laughs> these sonars are amazing. I don't want to get out of them. They're really, really good. Um, my mother has fluctuating blood pressure and she is on blood, pre blood pressure medication. Um, and um, I, she's changed to a whole food plant-based diet with still about three eggs um, per week. Um, and I know you are, what you have to say about eggs. <laughs> I say the same to her, but, you know, I can't get her off the eggs. Um, she has now dizziness, and she's afraid of falling very often, and her blood pressure fluctuates um, pretty much. Could that has, have something to do that she has dizziness? Okay, so uh, let's go back to the conversation we were having about treating blood pressure in the elderly populations. Really important. So first of all, that um, what we call labile hypertension, where the blood pressure is fluctuating a lot, uh, that can be extremely vexing. And we think we've got control over it. Oh, if they don't mm, drink coffee, or if they, nobody upsets them, or uh, if they don't have a big sodium load the night before. You think you can get control of all the factors, and it's still going to be highly variable. That does happen. Um, and so what you, what you must do, first of all, is try to make sure that the blood pressure is not too low in the standing position. So you do a sitting and a standing. And then the next question is, is the feeling of dizziness even related to the blood pressure? And it can be because of the blood pressure dropping suddenly, okay? But it also could be because of uh, problems in the so-called posterior circulation, where you actually need to look, so so-called lacunar infarcts that happen with high blood pressure. And so it actually is a, a manifestation of damage to the brain. And so sometimes you need uh, just a standing blood pressure. Sometimes you need a neurologic evaluation, including an MRI, to try to figure out whether that's what's going on. Okay. Hi, Dr. Williams. Uh, Hi. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here today. Um, I just wanted to ask you about low blood pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, I've suffered from that. Whenever I go to get my blood pressure taken, everybody takes it four or five times. They'll you know, ask me if I'm dizzy. I say no, and then they say, okay. And I'm wondering if there's any concern or um, issues that come along with that. So, um, the, I guess the biggest advice I would give to someone with low blood pressure is to rearrange your uh, retirement funds because you're going to live a long time. Okay? <laughs> okay? So, yeah, I, I, I used to, I, I never uh, worried too much about it until it happened to me. I mean, so African-American, of course, when I started medical school, blood pressure 140, read in the physiology book about sodium, cut the sodium, went to 128, thought I was doing good, went vegan, 104. And sometimes, <laughs> that's right. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you take a blood pressure and it's 104, and then it's 98, and you worry a little bit, and then you stand up and, you know, you're not dizzy. So you're not dizzy. That's the important thing. So that's really a, a great thing. Uh, keep the blood pressure low. Uh, keep doing all the things that you're doing. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you, you, you know, the, the, what, what do we really worry about? That you get a fever or some illness or something like that, and your blood pressure is going to go to 70, and they're going to start trying to you know, give you a whole bunch of medication. 
Uh, that could happen, but just uh, probably the most important thing is just to inform the healthcare practitioner, which I'm sure you do, that's my normal blood pressure. Okay? All right, very good. Hi. Um, you didn't discuss water at all, and I know for some people, like especially elderly, they'll get dizzy from not being hydrated enough um, and their blood pressure being elevated. And then the second question is, there's not a lot of doctors who are open to a plant-based diet. They still think it's not going to make a big difference. So what do you suggest for people to be their own advocate with their doctors? So the issue with water is that there just isn't a lot of data on it. <clears throat> you see a lot of healthcare providers who say you should be drinking like two quarts of water, and then you find nephrologists who say, oh my goodness, two quarts is fine, but if you go over that, you're going to wash out your, ready for this, renal medullary gradient, and you could end up with hyponatremia, low sodium, uh, and so, uh, or so-called water toxicity. Um, so there isn't a lot of relationship between um, blood pressure therapy and water consumption, one way or the other, to be able to make a class one anything uh, recommendation. Um, it, but dehydration is a problem. If a person's intake is very poor, uh, that really is the issue. And I'd be worried not just about water, but about calorie intake, and because that is one of the manifestations of frailty in older people. And, you know, I, I showed you the outcome and didn't focus on it. But if you saw those event rates or the mortality rate or the survival rate in frail people, it was terrible. It was better if you treat their blood pressure, but it still was terrible. And so everything we can do <coughs> excuse me, to keep our older population active uh, would be really, really helpful. Um, so you had a second question, though. It was? Um, a lot of doctors still are not on board with oh, plant-based right. diets. Yeah. So it's. And so, yeah, I, I'm always talking about the, you know, the leading cause of death of physicians and cardiologists being heart disease, uh, and because nobody's aware of of, uh, of plant-based nutrition. Uh, unfortunately, the, those numbers are being challenged now because uh, of uh, uh, physician burnout and all the issues that are associated with that. But um, I would say the the best thing to do, particularly in the hypertension area, is to refer them to our hypertension guideline. And they will see that table with the lifestyle changes and see that the numerically largest way of changing a patient's blood pressure without a drug is to just put them on that DASH diet or something that has a lot of fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes. You do that, the patient's blood pressure is going to get better. Hi. Oh. Hi. I think she's... <laughs> Uh, thank you. I worry about having a heart attack because it's all over my family. It, my blood pressure has been funny, so I'm monitoring. I'm, do, I'm doing uh, uh, Esselstyn for a few years. I'm pre mostly good. But I'm, my question is, for someone who wants to be, have, be able to have something between home and EMT or hospital, if something is suspicious, what is a substance that we can have to maybe take? Like, shall I continue carrying 2,000 milligrams of magnesium with me at all times? Is there cayenne pepper good? Something like that. That's my question, if that's part of your bailiwick. Wow. So uh, a little off the type of tension uh, concept, uh, but I would say that there's no magic bullet when other than doing plant-based nutrition knowing what your risk is, knowing what your cholesterol is. And if I had to pick one thing that's going to stop people from having heart attacks, it would be having an LDL cholesterol that's as low as possible. Um, and so uh, hopefully you know what that, what that is. And if it's, if it's high, then it is of concern. Um, well, mine is high, and I'm working on that. But anyway, mm -hmm. my other question is, have we gotten away from uh, – Cardio CRP, lipoprotein, homocysteine on the predictive diagnostic tests? Not, not exactly. Um, dealing with them one at a time. Homocysteine, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago was a really big deal because of the recognition that there's like about 12 different ways where homocysteine messes up your blood vessels and promotes um, you know, heart attack, stroke, and death. And there were two large randomized trials that got in the way. Uh, they were giving B12 and B6 
lowered homocysteine levels dramatically and had no impact on cardiovascular or overall mortality. And there was a trend toward worsening. Uh, and so uh, we sort of stopped measuring it, not because it's not important, but, but because there's nothing you can do about it. Now, is that one of the things that improves with plant-based nutrition? Absolutely. Okay, so then let's do CRP. So uh, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, you know, popularized by my good buddy, uh, Paul Ritker at Harvard. Um, he's uh, a very dynamic guy looking at inflammation, looking at treating it with multiple different ways. Um, and every plant-based nutrition uh, evaluation has shown that plant-based nutrition decreases inflammation. And C-reactive protein will decrease dramatically, and that may be one of the major mechanisms, along with the cholesterol uh, reduction, uh, at why you can decrease heart attack, stroke, and death. Um, so we don't measure it a lot, mostly because uh, it correlates very well, both in terms of statins, in terms of exercise, in terms of uh, diet. All of them reduce both LDL cholesterol and C-reactive C protein. Uh, and in fact, there was a large trial, the Cantos trial, where a drug, canakinumab, that decreased the uh, inflammation markers but didn't decrease LDL cholesterol. Uh, did not decrease, it did have an impact, but it was a much smaller impact than what uh, folks were hoping. So treating inflammation by itself without the rest, re improving in uh, cholesterol, didn't seem to be quite as impactful. Hi there. Hi. Uh, my question uh, <laughs> is regarding using, uh, across the board with all, all pharmaceuticals, chronic long-term use leading to deficiencies, side effects, and can you speak a little bit, I know it's a protocol, you know, it's specialized for everybody, but any protocol in regards to weaning off medication and when's the right time to do that if your health is, is in a good state? So that actually was the topic, <laughs> okay? So you thought, the, uh, what number was it, everybody? Where you would want to, where your target, where if you're below there, you could come off your medication? 120, 130, 130, okay. So still, yes, at 120, we're elevated, but we don't use drugs. Okay, for it. So yeah, if we if we get if you are able to start with your drugs, uh, and sometimes uh, having blood pressure treated for a long time softens up the blood vessels a little bit, uh, improve kidney function. You actually may see uh, a reduction in blood pressure that's sustainable without drugs. Um, but it's usually those big lifestyle things that we talked about in the guidelines. Okay that once you do all of those, you get the blood pressure down and you start weaning off, you know, cutting the drugs in half. Um, you know, it did happen to one of my patients who went vegan, so I always tell this story. Blood pressure was elevated, it took me about, I don't know, almost 10 years to get, them, get him to go vegan. He did. <clears throat> blood pressure had a dramatic fall. He wasn't monitoring them, as I always tell all my patients. And so he's feeling pretty bad, uh, went to his primary care doctor, I feel weak, dizzy, I don't feel like exercising, measures the blood pressure, it's 80 over 50, and the doctor says, you have to eat meat so that you can take your Diavan HCT. Yeah, so um, the recognition that when you change any of these parameters that we're talking about and your lifestyle impacts your blood pressure, that you have to uh, back off of the drugs and you're using 130 as the threshold. And so, uh, yeah, there will be people. Uh, I say, uh, if you looked at them, going back many, many slides to that Neil Barnard meta-analysis, you look at the, about one third of those studies showed absolutely dramatic drops in blood pressure. Some of them were moderate, some of them were mild. But that, that one third who had dramatic reductions in blood pressure, they have to come off their drugs or else they're, you're putting them in danger. So we're always monitoring. And how do we do it? Home blood pressures, okay? And using 130. <coughs> Dr. Williams, uh, one question that do you do pharmacological tests to see that which drugs suit the patients or no? because the, some of the labs they do offer, but it is not routinely done. Mm -hmm. So if the patient is put on losartine, amlodipine, or whatever, but if it doesn't suit them, 
they can take that uh, you know the results to the doctor and tell them is it a common practice not common practice so what happened to pharmacogenomics whatever happened to that so about 10 years ago we pretty much thought that we were going to be able to take a person's dna and tell them which drug was going to be the best for them well, it turns out that in the larger studies, it doesn't seem to make as big a difference as we thought. Um, and that applies to a lot of drugs. But, you know, it, it, you're, you're hearing new and different things, such as cancer therapy. There are places that are doing, you know, taking the cancer cells, doing them different kinds of treatment and coming up with exactly what the treatment could be. I don't know that we're ever going to get there with high blood pressure just because there's so many different kinds of environmental factors. I mean, that, that table with the lifestyle changes, those are big, big deals. Uh, and you've, a person has to be able to try to negotiate all of that. So it's not just genetics. There are some broad swaths that you can take away uh, that are in the guidelines, such as people with uh, African-American heritage okay, or self-identified African-Americans really should be on a diuretic, okay? Because the, the, the change in blood pressure is much larger with that uh, than, say, for example, with an ACE inhibitor uh, or amlodipine, which uh, they, they're great drugs, uh, but the impact is gonna be higher in different, different uh, subsets of people. But that's really not genomics. Those are self-identified um, you know, ethnicities. And so I'm not sure that we're going to get there soon, it, but hopefully at some point we will. And also the heavy metals and, you know, because it is so important to look into the heavy metals and detoxicity that, you know, everybody is detoxifying your system. Like in the back, they have this uh, infrared sauna that without, as you know, you are not perspiring and removing your toxins. So could that be considered in the near future? So again, we're looking for hard evidence, um, you know, ran prospective randomized trials. The best therapy for heavy metals that's been out there is chelation therapy. Uh, and there was the TAC-1 and the, hopefully the TAC-2 trial will be uh, uh, published soon. These were attempts to do um, EDTA uh, infusions to get all the heavy metals and, and try to get calcium out of coronaries. And the improvement in outcomes was minuscule uh, and really not the kind of uh, improvement in outcome that you would get, for example, with a statin uh, or aspirin, not even close. And so, you know, I, we don't have a, a, if I had to pick one heavy metal to avoid, it probably would be, you know, getting people, <coughs> getting people off of uh, uh, seafood that has mercury. Okay, because that does increase blood pressure. The other one that increases blood pressure uh, and cardiovascular disease, including heart attack, is lead. So what's our biggest source of lead? It's not lead paint. It's not toddlers picking paint off the wall like it was when we were kids. It's actually gunshot wounds. And that's uh, plenty of literature, totally not recognized, that leaving residual bullet fragments in a patient can actually increase their blood pressure as well as uh, increasing their cardiovascular events. So if you just Google that, you'd, you'd, people would see that. Uh, and people will see the bullet fragments on an x-ray and say, oh, oh, there's bullet fragments. No, that actually has cardiovascular meaning, uh, totally unrecognized. Time? Okay. All right. Thank you very much.